Good morning, friends, and welcome to another Family Bible Hour, this week again on YouTube. Uh, I'm not sure if you're like me, but I sure miss meeting with everybody and uh, seeing each other at the chapel, and I know um, here in the next month that's going, not going to be possible. So I wish that everybody is well and finding ways to um, enjoy family, be together. We prayed this uh, last Friday morning at prayer that we would utilize this time to draw closer in our family. Actually, John Best brought that point up and it's uh, resonated with me over the weekend. So hopefully you're doing the same. Let's pray together. Father, as we bow together before Randy comes and uh, brings your word to us from Isaiah 53, we just thank you, Father, for your providence and care over each of us. We thank you, Father, that you are faithful and unchanging, that you rule in righteousness and justice, and that you give us your truth through your word. We thank you, Father, for this, and we thank you that in your word we discover your son, this line from Genesis through to Revelation, this red line of redemption. And as we look into Isaiah 53 again, we're reminded that this is the gospel according to Isaiah. And Father, we just are encouraged to be studying this for five weeks together. Bless Randy as he, as he comes and speaks to us, Father. We pray for those who... Um, need your special hand of care upon their lives physically as they recover from operations and from sicknesses and from various um, ailments in their lives. We pray for them today. Thank you, Father, for uh, this time, for the technology we can enjoy in our homes and to be taught by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like of sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked. But with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many." for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This week is uh, part two in our five-part series in Isaiah chapter 53, which we've entitled The Gospel According to Isaiah. And Randy's going to come to us in just a few minutes, and he's going to look at the first three verses of chapter 51. But I've got a question for you. Did you do your homework? This week in Randy's update, he asked us and assigned to us, actually, some homework, and that was to watch um, Israel Cohen's testimony that is posted on YouTube, and Randy gave us the link. Uh, we as a family watched it right after the service last week, and what a testimony it was from this uh, man who has come to know the Messiah after so many years. So this week, the focus will be on suffering, and as Randy mentioned in his um, update this week, we will look at the incomprehensible suffering, as Randy put it, of Jesus Christ 
and how this demonstrates that suffering in the lives of his people has redemptive value. Have you ever thought about that? Redemptive value. Let's listen in as Randy brings this to us in a couple of minutes. A couple other things to note is that the chapel won't be open this Sunday for financial donations, but you can send it in the mail to Ken Peak, and his address was given to us in the Bethel Update, and you can also check your chapel directory app as well. The deacons uh, and elders have met recently and updated our meeting together plan, and Randy included a copy of that in the update this week. If you didn't get a copy or you're not uh, on that email list as part of Bethel, you can get on that list by uh, getting in touch with Randy or reach out to one of the deacons and they will email you a copy of that uh, meeting together update. Uh, changes have been noted in red. Also, we've got a date for you to save on your calendar and that's the Bethel Annual General Meeting scheduled for Saturday evening of February the 20th. Restrictions permitted, so, permitting, so uh, keep, keep that on your calendar and watch for more updates uh, in the in the weeks ahead. Remember, this series has the purpose and challenge in the coming weeks that our objective will be to more deeply value Christ and his gospel. And one more thing to remember, let's pray for one another. Prayer meetings on Wednesday have been uh, postponed, but we still meet men at 7 a.m. And thank you to all the men that met with us this past Friday. It was fantastic to have 12 guys fill the screen, including Jeremy all the way from PNG. Let's listen in as Randy brings Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 3. Have a great week. Hello, Bethel, and welcome back to our study of the gospel according to Isaiah 53. As Ken read that text, it's obvious that suffering is a prominent theme in Isaiah 53. And if you've got your Bibles open, as uh, Sean indicated, we're looking at the first three verses of Isaiah 53 this morning. Last session, we looked at the concluding three verses of chapter 52, because those verses are really the first paragraph, the first stanza of this poem of the suffering servant. Suffering being the dominant theme of this poem. It raises the question, if God is good, why is there suffering in the world? Why are babies stillborn? Why do young mums get cancer? Why is there injustice and war and ethnic cleansing? Why do we have this pandemic? John Stuart Mill was a, a British philosopher, thinker, cultural observer. He lived in the 19th century. And when he observed suffering around him, he said, if God is omnipotent or all-powerful, then God cannot be good. Or if God is good, he cannot be omnipotent or all-powerful. Mill said that because he reached the conclusion that if God was really good, then with his power, he would intervene and stop human suffering. And if he doesn't stop human suffering, the conclusion we can reach is that he is either not able to or he's not good and really doesn't want to. But the hidden assumption in Mill's assertion that if God is omnipotent, he cannot be good, and if he's good, he cannot be omnipotent, the hidden assumption is that somehow it's God's job to eliminate pain. It's God's role to eliminate evil and sickness and cancer and child abuse and war and injustice and pandemics. Mill would say that God is there because he's really just responsible to make our lives more enjoyable, more comfortable, more happy. That in some sense, God's job is to reverse all of the damage that we've done. But that's not who God is. That's not what he does, at least not according to the Bible. People have this view that God's job is to eliminate suffering because of great biblical ignorance. Isn't it interesting that we live in the most educated culture in human history, and at the same time, biblical ignorance is rampant. It's pervasive. It's widespread. It's persistent. So if that's not what God is responsible to do, if God's responsibility is not to stop all human suffering, how are we to understand it? 
how are we to come to grips with the existential deal of having to suffer? Because if you're not suffering now, and many of you are, you will suffer. That's the, the certainty of life. Or as my wife says, somebody close to you is suffering, and that's even worse. Some people that I'm talking to now, some of you have serious health challenges. Some of you are dealing with the, the, the pain-racked body that results from aging. Some people are under great stress as they're awaiting medical results or even waiting, awaiting medical appointments. Many people, many of you are struggling with anxiety or, or depression or mental fatigue. Maybe you're just fed up with the isolation of the current uh, situation. Some of you have financial challenges and employment uncertainty. Other people are struggling in their marriage or they're struggling with the relationship of a, an estranged child. Maybe you've recently suffered a miscarriage. Suffering is a prominent theme of the gospel according to Isaiah 53. So let's look at it together, see what we can learn. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and if you've got your Bible open, I'm at verse 1 of chapter 53, where the prophet Isaiah asks this rhetorical question. Who has believed what he has heard from us? Isaiah's message was rejected by his Jewish contemporaries. Isaiah was commissioned by God back in Isaiah chapter 6 to be God's prophet. He was to caution and warn and confront and challenge and provoke the people of Judah, the Jewish people, because they were moving away from God in serious ways, significant ways. And the Lord had commissioned Isaiah telling him, you are to speak on my behalf to these people, but... These people will ignore you. They don't want to hear what you have to say. They don't want to see what you are drawing for them. They don't want to understand your message. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And the prophet goes on in verse 1 to say, And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm of the Lord was a, a metaphor, a Hebrew metaphor that talked about military power and the images of a soldier rolling up his sleeves and bearing his muscular arm. He's about to take up his weapon and crush his enemies. But Isaiah is not talking here about a mere human soldier or gladiator. He's talking about the omnipotent God of the universe. He's the one to be feared. If you're engaged in your Bible reading program now, and because this is January, I know many of you are starting back in the early books of the Old Testament, you'll know that as you read through the Old Testament that God's power has always been on display. The arm of the Lord has always been revealed among the Hebrew people. That's the Old Testament record. Back in the book of Genesis, in chapter 12, God made his covenant with Abraham and with Abraham's descendants through Isaac. In the book of Exodus, the Lord had used Moses as the deliverer to take the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt and send them on to the promised land. And in the book of Joshua, Joshua himself is the one who leads the children of Israel into the promised land, and the Lord gives them this unstoppable power to vanquish enemies city by city as they take over the promised land. Once you move into the books of Samuel and the books of Kings, four centuries later, David and Solomon are the kings. Israel is now a superpower on the world stage. It's the most prosperous nation on the earth. In fact, the book of, the book of 1 Kings says that during the time of Solomon, silver was as common in Jerusalem as stones. I've been to Jerusalem. There are a lot of stones there. That's a little bit like saying in northern Ontario that silver is as plentiful as snow. Silver was everywhere. The nation was very prosperous. But even with all of those displays of the Lord's provision and the Lord's power, 
the nation of Israel went into spiritual decline. They demonstrated spiritual apathy and indifference. They demonstrated spiritual rebellion. And they demonstrated disobedience to God. And they began to spiral into idolatry. And idolatry led even to greater pagan practices like child sacrifice. And the Lord brought many enemies against Israel to challenge and to conquer and to subjugate the nation. The Assyrians, and the Babylonians, and they were followed by the Medo-Persians, and they were followed by Alexander the Great and the Greeks. And finally, after the Lord Jesus had been and had gone back into heaven, the nation of Israel was annihilated by the Romans. And the city of Jerusalem, the holy city, on the holy mount, containing the holy temple, was destroyed in the summer of 70 AD. The Romans evicted the Jews from the Holy Land. And an amazing thing happened that different from any other conquered people group and against all predictions to the contrary, the Jewish people retained their ethnic identity. They retained their specific Jewish religion. They retained their culture for almost 19 centuries. Others have been evicted from their homeland or chosen to move away from their homeland, and often their ethnicity has been assimilated into the people around them within three or four generations. But not the Jews. Incredibly, they survived for 1,900 years without a homeland. And they survived through the Holocaust of the last century. Until in May, May 15th of 1948, they were given back their homeland and Israel was declared as an independent nation. And almost immediately, Israel had to defend herself, had to defend her borders against Arab enemies that had determined that their objective was to push the Jewish nation into the Mediterranean Sea. Since 1948, how many times has the nation of Israel had to fight against and defend herself against much bigger enemies? In the last 73 years, Israel has often escaped imminent defeat. They've been victorious over larger, more well-equipped enemies, and that has been evidence of the arm of the Lord. The arm of the Lord has been revealed throughout Hebrew history and right to the present Jewish nation. Some of you will remember the war that was fought in the Middle East in June of 1967. And if you've read about that, or if you've heard about any of it, you'll know that the, the whole world knew that Israel's Arab enemies were itching to start a battle to conquer the Jewish state. They were led by Egypt, and Israel launched a preemptive strike, and the battle lasted only six days. Israel conquered her foes on the east and the west and the north, fighting a three-staged battle. The war would have even been shorter than six days, but Israel was under enormous pressure from the U.S. and the United Nations to stop the battle. This was a battle that was going to be at the behest of her Arab enemies. But Israel waited until they had taken back the city of Jerusalem, the, the, the uh, eastern part of the city, and the Wailing Wall, and the Temple Mount, and then they were prepared to stop the battle. This was a jaw-dropping, miraculous series of events that allowed Israel to defeat her enemies. But that's one example of the arm of the Lord. And the arm of the Lord has been evident throughout Jewish history, from the time of Abraham to Moses, to David to Isaiah, to the time of the Lord Jesus, to the present, until the future return of Christ. National Israel has witnessed every evidence of the arm of the Lord protecting them. And yet, the nation has refused to believe, for the most part, there is a minority that believes, but the majority of Jews 
throughout the last 2,000 years have refused to recognize what the prophets have taught. They've refused to recognize the teaching of their own tonic, our Old Testament, about the suffering servant, the coming Messiah. And so they have rejected the message of Christ. The Jews, you could say, have been unimpressed with the arm of the Lord. But the Jews have also been unimpressed with his suffering servant. I'll write a blog post uh, that I'll put up this weekend about the servant songs of Isaiah. Because in the second section of the book of Isaiah, there are servant songs that point ahead to the coming Messiah. Verse 2. Speaking of the suffering servant, speaking of the Messiah, because Isaiah 53 is one of those servant songs, verse 2 says, For he grew up before him like a young plant. This line, this phrase, is describing the Lord Jesus, God's Son, growing up as a child, as a teen, as a young man, as his Father in heaven watched on. But it's interesting that Isaiah used the term Yonic for this young plant, which in Hebrew means a sucker plant, something that is superfluous, unnecessary. It's insignificant, it's random, it's unwanted, and therefore it's cut off. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of a dry ground. In Israel, if you've been there, you'll know that there are wadis. These are dry stream beds or dry river beds that are dry for much of the year. And the ground becomes very cracked. The clay becomes cracked and, uh, and porous as it breaks up under that hot Middle Eastern sun. This lone sprig is sprouting in that cracked, dry clay. And that pictures the servant who took root in the dry ground. This spiritually very dry culture spiritually dry culture of first century Israel was where the, this Messiah grew up. Verse 2, continuing on. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. In Hebrew history, most of the characters are not described in terms of what they looked like. But there were a few men who were unique physical specimens. Something about them was very noticeable and attractive to the eye. The text tells us, the historical narrative tells us that Joseph, back in the book of Genesis, was a good-looking man. We know that King David was a good-looking man. We know that his son Absalom had uh, terrific hair. We know that King Saul was head and shoulders above anybody else in the nation. But the Messiah was one who would not stand out for his radiant good looks or for his physical features. In fact, in a culture where family connection was important, Jesus of Nazareth was seen as being nobody from nowhere. And that was incongruent with the messianic profile that had been developed by the rabbis over the centuries. Jesus was a common person. He was born of unmarried parents. Sure, he performed some inexplicable miracles. He taught with unparalleled authority, but he wasn't what was expected as the Messiah, and therefore he was rejected. But why was that? Why did they not recognize him as the Messiah when he fulfilled so much of the Old Testament prophecy? In fact, in the book of Isaiah itself, it talks about the issue of blindness. Blindness was a common problem in the ancient world. There wasn't a single record of blindness, uh, protracted blindness, being cured in the Old Testament, not one. And yet the book of Isaiah said twice, once in Isaiah 35 and once in the servant song of Isaiah 61, that when the Messiah came, Blindness would be cured, that sight would be given to the blind. And the rabbi said, when we see someone given sight to the blind, 
we will know that's the Messiah. It seems as you read through the Gospels that Jesus performed the miracle of healing blind eyes almost as much as he did anything. And yet, they didn't recognize him for who he was. It's as if, metaphorically, the eyes of his observers and of the Jewish elite were blinded to see the truth of who he was. Verse 3 tells us more about this suffering servant. Notice these words. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The verbs and the adjectives from verse 1 onward through Isaiah 53, when talking about the identity and the suffering and the death of the servant, are decidedly past tense. You'll notice that. He was despised and rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows. He was somebody who was acquainted with grief. Why is that? Isaiah's writing and projecting ahead. He's writing seven centuries before the time of Christ, but he's writing as if this has already happened. Because it's as certain as if it had already happened. And suffering is dominant. Last week, we were looking at those final verses of chapter 52. Look at verse 14. Here's how the New International Version conveys it. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness. Disfigurement, suffering of this servant of the Lord. And verse 3 continues, And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Isaiah here is talking on behalf of the people of Israel. He's grouping himself in with the Jewish people and talking about how when the Messiah would come, seven centuries later, how the people would hide their faces from him, how they would reject him, how they would demonstrate their contempt for him. I used to be in the corporate world. And when I was in that world, I often had the opportunity in the insurance industry to visit large insurance companies, particularly in Toronto. And when I was in those companies, one of the things that I like to observe is how the people who were the very senior bosses, the executive suite type, the senior executives, when they would come down onto the floor where the common people were, the clerks, the underwriters, the, the foot soldiers of the company, how when the top generals of that company would come down to where the foot soldiers were, how they interacted with those people at their desks. Some would come down and they would engage with those office floor workers. They would show them respect. There were others who would come down and they would drop their head. They would hide their face. They wouldn't make eye contact. And the clear message was that they were demonstrating, whether they meant it or not, it was clear that they were demonstrating disrespect and contempt. That's what Isaiah means when he says, he was one from whom men hide their faces. They were showing that the Lord Jesus was despised, and they were showing their contempt and their disrespect. The man on the screen in front of you now is a man by the name of Sam Nadler. And I'll, uh, I'll post his video testimony um, this week for you because you'll find him very interesting. Sam was a Jew from New York City. And he had this question that was his opening question. Just like we looked at the question at the beginning of our discussion tonight, if God is all-powerful and if God is good, how could he let suffering be in the world? Sam's question was similar. How could we believe in a God, Sam said, who would allow such a horror, the Holocaust, to happen to our people? That's a pretty profound Jewish question. Because in World War II, 
The Jewish population in Europe was 9 million. And by the end of World War II, the Nazis had slaughtered 6 million Jews. 6 million of the 9 million Jews who lived in Europe died as a result of the Holocaust. When Sam, as a young man back in the 60s, thought about that, he wanted to pose the question to his rabbi. His rabbi was a guy that he liked, a man that he respected, but he didn't quite like the answer. When he asked his rabbi about God and the Holocaust, his rabbi said, he who questions cannot believe, and he who believes cannot question. Sam didn't find that to be a very satisfying response. He was drafted into the U.S. Army, and he experienced the horrors of Vietnam, the terrors of war, the, the fact that he was surrounded by people, soldiers, men and women, who were using substances heavily to numb the pain of war. And Sam, too, became very immersed in substance abuse. After the war, he came back to San Francisco, and he was confronted by some Jewish street evangelists who were talking about Jesus as the Messiah. They invited Sam to a Bible study. He had no idea what a Bible study was, but he agreed to go. And when he got there, he found that they were studying from their Bibles Isaiah 53. He had never seen Isaiah 53 before. Here's a Jewish man. He was somewhat familiar with the Bible, but he said Isaiah 53 was really always avoided by our rabbis. But when he read Isaiah 53 for the first time at that Bible study, he said it was clearly talking about Jesus, whom the Jewish people refer to as Yeshua. But he didn't say that out loud. He didn't want these people to know that he recognized Jesus in Isaiah 53. In fact, what he did say is, these are really tricky, sneaky people. He went on to say, they put part of their Bible in what is supposed to be our Bible. And then he got back to his pet peeve. When these people pressed him, Sam, who is Isaiah 53 talking about? He diverted the conversation by saying, where was this God during the Holocaust? But that night, that Bible study, that passage in Isaiah 53 got him thinking that possibly Jesus was, in fact, the Jewish Messiah. Months later, January 1972, one night, Sam got saved. Sam received Christ by faith, and he didn't know what to do with that. What is a Jew to do when he becomes a Christ follower? And so he did what he thought was reasonable. He contacted those people all those months before from this Bible study. And he said, here's what he said to them, I came to your Bible thing a long time ago. Jesus saved me last night. What do I do now? And to his shock, he found out that the people in that Bible study had prayed for him since the night of that Bible study every day until he came to faith. And today, when Sam's asked that question that he posed all those years before, how can you believe in a God who allowed the Holocaust? He now says to people, when they ask that question of him, look at Christ. He points to his Messiah, the Lord Jesus, because he says about Christ, and I quote Sam here, he understands the pain of the Holocaust. What can we take away from this text, these three verses that we've studied together this morning? The theme of the chapter is unparalleled suffering. We've said that throughout. But I think there are two takeaways for us, two points of application to our own lives. And here's the first. That understanding the epic suffering of the Lord Jesus, to understand the epic suffering of this one, the suffering servant, this one who was the Jewish Messiah, causes us to have a greater appreciation, a greater capacity to treasure Christ. If you're a Christ follower, when you consider what the Lord Jesus went through for you and for me, we can't help but love 
and honor and respect and esteem him more highly. Think of Jesus' disciples back at the time in the first century in the Gospels, because their attitude towards what Jesus talked about when he predicted his suffering and his death was a pretty typical Jewish first century response. His suffering, his death to them seemed to be the, the furthest thing possible from what was right, from what was expected, from the image that they had created of their Messiah. Do you remember that incident in Matthew 16? It's called the Caesarea Philippi Confession, where Peter says before the Lord Jesus and the other disciples who were looking on, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Lord Jesus commended him for that recognition. But moments later, Peter committed a massive blunder. When the Lord Jesus told his disciples that he was going to go on to Jerusalem, that he would suffer at the hands of the Jewish elite, and that he would die. Far be it from you, Lord, Peter said, that shall not happen to you. And the Lord had to reprimand Peter for that. Get behind me, Satan, he said. I'm sure Peter remembered the burning intensity of those words for the rest of his life. But Peter and the disciples did not understand that the Messiah was the Abed Yahweh. In Hebrew, that means the slave of God. The Messiah was the suffering servant of God. Christ came willingly to suffer and to die for our salvation. He knew from the outset that that was his commission, that he would absorb the wrath of God for my sin for your sin when he hung on the cross that Friday afternoon. He would make salvation and eternal life contingent on us simply receiving and believing in him. That's called faith. But his suffering and his death is what made that possible. He suffered beyond what anybody has ever suffered. But he did that for those of us who have faith in him, who have received salvation, who are guaranteed of eternal life, and who are followers of Christ. Number two, understanding the epic suffering of Christ, I think can help us understand our own suffering better. Sometimes when we suffer when we suffer physically, when we suffer emotionally, when we suffer relationally, when we suffer psychologically, when we experience loss, sometimes people will say to us, well, God had nothing to do with that because God is a God of love. It's true that God is a God of love. It's true that God is a good God, but it's perverse thinking. It's heretical theology to say that God had nothing to do with it. Because when you and I suffer, we must remember that God has everything to do with our suffering. Why? Because he is sovereign. He knows everything. He has all power. And he recognizes that suffering has redemptive value. Whenever we suffer, if we understand who God is, we know that God has the power to intervene and stop it. God has the power to turn it off. God has the power to heal. God has the power to immediately change the situation. But suffering in our lives has redemptive value to make us more like the Lord Jesus. And the Lord allows suffering in our lives for that purpose. His objective is not to make us superficially happy. His objective is to give us the joy of knowing that we are becoming incrementally, bit by bit, day by day, more like the Lord Jesus. The Bible calls that sanctification, becoming more holy, more Christ-like. And suffering is clearly seen in the life and the death of the Lord Jesus as having ultimate redemptive value. Every life has suffering. 
And often the Christian life brings more suffering just because we belong to Christ. But we know three things. Let me conclude with a Christian or a biblical worldview of suffering. Number one, we know with confidence, we know with certainty that God never wastes pain in the lives of his people because he uses pain to bring about his purposes. How do we know that? Romans 8 and 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And his purpose is to make us holy. He uses suffering in our lives to bring about that purpose, that objective. Number two, there is coming a day when for us, those who follow Christ, all suffering will be over. Suffering will be entirely in the rearview mirror. We will never experience it again. That's why also in Romans 8, uh, verse 18, Paul said, I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. And number three, when we think about the fact that God doesn't waste any pain in the lives of his people, when we recognize that there is coming a day when we will no longer suffer, we must also remember number three, that the Lord Jesus is the ultimate example of suffering redemptively. He, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, suffered beyond what we ever will. When he was on the cross, I wonder if the physical suffering and pain was hardly even noticed by him because of the relational pain he suffered and being separated from his father as he bore the sin of the world. But suffering was the Messiah's calling. Mes suffering was the Messiah's purpose. And Isaiah 53 teaches us that being the suffering servant, taking on that role, is the heart of the gospel. The Lord Jesus, the slave of God, the Abed Yahweh, the suffering servant, is at the heart of the gospel of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we consider these things, we recognize that this text is so deep and it's so broad and it's so comprehensive that our puny minds can only begin to scratch the surface. But we ask, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, you would enable us, you would give us the ability to see more deeply, to comprehend more broadly, and thereby to treasure your Son more profoundly. We love the Lord Jesus. Help us to love him more accurately. Help us to worship him in spirit and in truth. We pray these things with confidence because we pray them in his name. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning.